My name is Margaret Kennedy, and on behalf of the Center for Ethics and Culture, I invite you all, or I welcome you all, to the final series or lecture of our Catholic literature series for this fall. Um, every fall since 2002, the Center has been putting on these lectures to help introduce students to the richness of the Catholic intellectual and literary tradition. Um, and so for this year's series, we chose to revisit Tolkien, who we've done in the past, but given the forthcoming Hobbit movie and um, Tolkien's deep Catholic heritage, we decided that he deserved another look. Um, so this, or tonight's lecture is Professor Ralph Wood, um, Professor of Theology and Literature at Baylor University. He has been at Baylor since 1998, prior to which he spent 26 years at Wake Forest University. His academic interests lie in interpreting major literary works from the 19th and 20th centuries from a Christian perspective. He hopes to demonstrate literature's relevance to the church as well as secular culture. He serves as editor-at-large for the Christian Century and as an editorial board member for both the Flannery O'Connor Review and Seven, an Anglo-American literary review. Among the books he has written is The Gospel According to Tolkien, Visions of the Kingdom in Middle-Earth. His lecture tonight is entitled, Is the Lord of the Rings an Explicitly Catholic Work? Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Ralph Wood. have so many friends here, have sent so many students here, um, have so many colleagues here, that I'm afraid if I began trying to name them, I would leave someone out. But let me say, uh, just briefly, that a former student of mine, John Betts, is now the faculty here in the Avengers, <coughs> that Amanda Wepler, and Lauren Rich are two students in medieval studies now. Can you hear me? It would help if I turn it on. <laughs> Making a difference? Okay, good, good. Amanda Wepler and Lauren Rich are students of mine from Baylor. This afternoon I met with two students from Providence College who are now in the law school, one of them and the other in theology, Francesca Geneva and Michael Wall. I'm very happy to say that Steve Fidoso and Tracy Westlake have been magnificent go-betweens uh, in the Center for Ethics and Culture, that Mary Keyes on the faculty here in political science has shanghaied me into talking about Tolkien to her freshman seminar and her senior seminar, um, that Carter Sneed is now running the Center for Ethics and Culture very, very ably after the long and very distinguished career of David Solomon. And I owe to David Solomon a debt beyond all paying because David first had confidence in me to invite me to lecture here and then to apply for the Marianne Remick Senior Fellowship in the Center for Ethics and Culture. And I was lucky enough to have that post in 2007 and eight. So I spent an entire year on the Notre Dame campus. So I feel like, as I say, this is really a kind of home for me. So thank you for helping make me feel at home tonight. And let me try to make a contested case with you about Tolkien. The contested case actually begins uh, in that spring of 2008, where my friend Tom Hibbs, a very distinguished Notre Dame graduate, PhD, who heads up the Honors College at Baylor, invited me to attend a meeting of the Sycamore Society, that's not quite the name of it. Trust. Sycamore. Trust. Sycamore Trust, which was kind of tied with homecoming uh, in the spring of 2008. And there at that meeting, a very elderly, dignified gentleman whom I would suspect to be in his mid-80s, creaked slowly to his feet and said, one thing troubles me very greatly. And that is, when I came to Notre Dame, because this was back in the 30s, 
He said, I became ever more Catholic for being at Notre Dame. What my grandchildren now tell me, he said, was this. At Notre Dame, they leave the campus less Catholic than when they entered, but, he added, more Christian. Strange formulation. They leave Notre Dame less Catholic than when they came, but more Christian. So I set myself the task of trying to figure out what that meant. So here's my thesis. I think it meant, I, must, I did collect my check early, so <laughs> if I uh, get in trouble here, I can make a quick exit. I think what that probably means is that at Notre Dame, a lot of Catholics learn to do good and equate doing good with being Christian and thus being Christian something higher than being Catholic. And since they've learned to do good, they emerge less Catholic but more Christian. But when I began to try to probe beneath that phenomenon, what I began to see is that many of these Catholic students, and I got to know a lot of them in that year, 2007 and 8, cherry pick from among Catholic doctrines and practices and dogmas so that those that are convenient to them, especially regarding matters of social justice, they vehemently advocate, while conveniently omitting practices that are not especially attractive to them, especially concerning issues of contraception and abortion. So what it means is that Notre Dame produces good little American or good big American liberals of the kind Walker Percy wickedly described as following all the ideologies of the asms and isms of the left. President Obama's being given the honorary degree, I suspect, is an example of what this phenomenon means. The error in that phenomenon is what I think Tolkien avoids, and so I would like to talk about that in a minute. That era is called instrumentalism. It means quite simply that the church becomes instrumental to an allegedly larger good, which is then puts the church in use of the achievement of that larger good, the liberation of women, for example, the overcoming of racial bigotry, for example, the combat against poverty and hunger and homelessness, all good things, yes. But the church becomes simply a means to those ends. And the first thing you know, once you have achieved those ends, you can kick out the prop which led you up to them. And so all you, all you have left is a kind of empty rhetoric of the American left. But to prove that my hero, Walker Percy, has made me what he calls an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> Let me give you the other side. The right has just as much a temptation to turn the gospel and the church into an instrument for the achievement of allegedly larger goods. So the Catholic right is very, very strong on life issues from birth all the way to death, so that euthanasia and abortion become evils that the Catholic right very valiantly opposes, heroically opposes. However, with a certain kind of cherry picking again of doctrines and practices, so that I don't hear enough squawking from my friends on the Catholic right about some other life issues, such as the death penalty, and above all, war. To me, the exemplary Catholic in these regards was the blessed John Paul II. Are you aware that he was the one figure of world stature to oppose the execution of Timothy McVeigh? Does everyone know who Timothy McVeigh was? 
the Oklahoma City bomber who brought down the Murrah building and 175 people to their deaths. Pope John Paul II, now blessed John Paul, was also a vehement opponent of the Iraq invasion. I used to irritate the dickens out of my Catholic friends at Baylor by saying, what is your stance on the Iraq war? I'm with the Pope. <laughs> and oh, they would get very, very, very nervous about that. So you're with me? You've got instrumentalism on the left, but unless you're very careful, you've got it on the right. The person who articulates the case to me in a fine, aphoristic way about why there is nothing larger than the church is G.K. Chesterton, who says, first of all, the, char the church is larger than me. Remember, he weighed 324 pounds. <laughs> He spent six weeks here in the year 1930 giving lectures in Washington Hall. Um, he was so large, he wore a cape that made him look like he weighed 400 pounds. <laughs> and it was the days, when, and of course his knees had long since gone. He couldn't stand for any lengthy period to address his audiences. So he had to sit at a desk and address the huge crowds that turned out, I think, what was it, twice weekly in 1930 to hear his lectures. And the microphones were just coming into being, and so aided his public lectures quite nicely. And he began his first lecture in Washington Hall by saying, I can't imitate his British accent. It's very high up in the air like this, unfortunately. But he said, ladies and gentlemen, I am not as large as I seem. This machine has amplified me. <laughs> But here's what Chesterton said, the church is not only larger than me, it is the largest thing in the world. And then he added, it is indeed larger than the world. And by the world, of course, he means the cosmos. He doesn't mean simply the earth. He doesn't mean simply the solar system. He means the cosmos. For if we take Colossians 1 seriously, Christ is present at the foundation of all things. In him, all things consist and cohere. And of course, the church is the community of Christ. Therefore, nothing larger than the church. And therefore, the church has its own intrinsic ends, which cannot be suborned by some instrumentalism, which would make it useful for other things. My case tonight is that Tolkien got this point right from the start and saw it, I think, to the core. Some of you know Michael Baxter. He was writing a book many years ago, I hope he finishes it one day, which is going to be entitled, and get this, it's just right, God, Notre Dame, Country. Gets it exactly right. You with me? If Notre Dame is centered upon the triune and incarnate God, that, of course, is the prime reality. But it is the place where consciences are formed so as to know how rightly to order the political realm in which we live and move and have our being, ordering it to the love of God. God, Notre Dame, country, not the switching of those last two items. I think that's exactly right. I think Tolkien got that right. So let's talk about him lest I get in even deeper trouble. <laughs> Tolkien did not want to make his Catholicism, he's a very devout Catholic, by the way, extraordinarily devout Catholic, daily Eucharist when possible, deep devotion to the Virgin Mary, um, a man who lived and breathed his Catholic faith. But he refused to make it instrumental to his art. He said, in fact, if my art has to have Catholic props, those props should be knocked out from under it. I want my art to stand on its own legs, to have its own intrinsic excellence, so that it doesn't have anything, as it were, standing beneath it to hold it up. 
It must succeed in its own terms. So what he does is to use the model of Beowulf. How many of you read Beowulf? Text to read while you're at Notre Dame. Good, good, good. He wrote the definitive essay in a great, great, still in print, still authoritative, called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. Great title. Because Beowulf had been a great mystery to generations of students of the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, because it's clearly a work out of the Germanic, Scandinavian North, and yet you've got these kind of odd moments which are not Scandinavian, which are not fatalistic, which are not about the way in which when Beowulf kills Grind the Grendel monster, he's going to stay dead. Something else is going on. So here's Tolkien's thesis. Tolkien's thesis is that Beowulf was recorded by Catholic monks who wanted to honor the pagan world by recreating it precisely as they had heard it created, probably chanted by bards of that world, but silently, quietly, subtly to infuse that work with a kind of implicit Catholicism. Not an explicit, top-down, heavy-handed Catholicism. And that argument has won the day. Almost no one disputes it now. And yet, it led to a very fundamental divide between Lewis, oh gosh, that never happens. <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> never happens. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just about to make fun of technology and I got caught. <laughs> Tolkien did not like the explicit Christianity of his friend C.S. Lewis's work. He did not care for the Narnian Chronicles at all. What do you do? Do you stop it? I hit the off button as long as I can hold it. Let's go hold it and hold it. Go off, go away, get. It's demonic. Now it's going off. He felt that the Narnia Chronicles were too obviously Christian. That if you can't figure out that Aslan is the Christ of Narnia, you ought to get an IQ test. <laughs> It's, it's, it's there, it's obvious, it's heavy-handed. He said that the, the title should be um, Aslan and the Love Life of a Fawn. Not a, nasty, not a good subtitle. He did, not like Tol he did not like Lewis's apologetic works. He thought Lewis was out of his depth. He thought Lewis was, again, using his Christian convictions to take shortcuts to make claims he was really not qualified to make. And therefore, his name for C.S. Lewis was every man's theologian. <laughs> Friends, that is not a compliment. <laughs> That's like saying Joe Blow's theologian. So Tolkien did not want his Catholicism to be instrumental to his art. He wanted it to be implicit to his art so deeply embedded that most people won't get it. For example, on the lecture circuit, and I address usually fellow evangelicals, they will say, well, how many people have come to Jesus by Tolkien? <laughs> and I say, as far as I know, none. And good. Tolkien did not want his art to be a means of evangelism. That's what is the church's primary office. He did not want his art then to be suborned uh, his Christianity to be suborned to his art and become a means for any kind of evangelism. He wanted to have its own intrinsic worth, its own intrinsic good. So here's my thesis. It derives from His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI's marvelous saying from the salt of the earth. Any of you know those marvelous interviews with the Pope by an atheist German um, journalist who was converted after he did these interviews. 
He could not believe Pope Benedict's willingness to be totally blunt and to answer any question. In those interviews, here's what he says. We are facing a new and different kind of epoch in the church's history, where Christianity will be again characterized more by the mustard seed, where it, the church, will exist in small, seemingly insignificant groups that nonetheless live in an intensive struggle against evil and that bring good into the world, that let God in. Then he continues, the church will in the foreseeable future no longer be the form of life for the whole society. The church will be a minority church. She will live against small, vital circles of really convinced believers who live out their faith. But precisely in this way, she will, biblically speaking, become the salt of the earth. There's his metaphor. In this upheaval, constancy, and then this is the key, keeping what is essential to man from being destroyed is once again more important and the powers of preservation that can sustain man and his humanity are ever more necessary. So my thesis then is this. What Tolkien does in The Lord of the Rings, and why I think The Lord of the Rings will endure as the Narnia Chronicles will not. If there is a world 100 years from now, the Lord of the Rings will still be around. I'm not as convinced that the Narnia Chronicles will. They have endured because they address all people of goodwill in non-theological terms. So as to try to do exactly what the Pope called us to do, to try to preserve what is essential in our humanity, to keep it from being destroyed by the maleficent forces of our culture, that is the groundwork of appeal that Tolkien's fiction has. I've lectured on Tolkien in completely secular places. I lectured on Tolkien in, in Oberlin. You want to know about Oberlin? It's to the left of the left of the left. The place packed out. Um, I, the room was, they did it at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, I guess to have as small a crowd as possible. The place was packed by good pagans drawn to Tolkien in ways they would not have been drawn to Lewis for the reasons I'm about to specify. Now that doesn't mean that Tolkien is going to say, well, we've just all got to be human together. We've got, you know, why can't we just trust each other like Rodney King says? He is more Catholic in being universally human, not less Catholic. So what he does in the Lord of the Rings is to embed Catholic hints, Catholic associations, but no Catholic allegories. He says, I cordially despise allegory in the modern world where one thing simply equals another thing. Most of you will call all of these. A lot of my Baylor students don't catch them. Although we have 12% Catholic students now, a student body of 2,000 Catholics at Baylor. We call ourselves the largest Catholic university in Texas. <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot call ourselves the largest Baptist university in Texas because A&M, of much scorn and spite, has 20,000 Baptist students. So we're, we're the biggest Catholic university, but not the biggest Baptist. How do you like that? So you will have caught many of these. Again, hints, suggestions, not Overt references, limbos, elven food, whey bread that does not satisfy the stomach, leaves you still in some sense hungry, but fortifies the will, makes you want to go forward, to struggle. That is a hint at, obviously, the Eucharist. So these are, I think, for Tolkien, the non-negotiables, the essentials that let him be universally human. It's not that he has to get over these to be universally human. It's because he's so grounded in these Catholic doctrines and sacraments and practices that he can be such. 
One obvious example. Uh, this one I discovered on my own. A little bit vaingloriously uh, proud of it. Remember how Baramir dies? Remember, Baramir has been the real, not Judas of the Lord of the Rings. If he were to have a human parallel in the biblical world, the Christian world, what would be the parallel to, par, the parallel to Baramir? Hands. Hands. Roughly speaking. Peter, Louder. Peter. Thank you. Peter. The one who betrays our Lord. He betrays, of course, the ring. Notice the company is not broken by a bunch of secular humanists. The company is broken from within by the faithful, all courageous Baramir because he thinks that he can use the power of the ring to destroy Sauron. And of course, it's a horrible moment. Frodo has to run from him, tries to get away. Sam catches up with him. And of course, later, Aragorn comes upon Baramir lying at the point of death. You want to know what he says? Very simple words. Aragorn, I tried to steal the ring from Frodo. Confessio oris. Confession of the mouth. But I'm sorry. Contritio cordis. Sorrow of heart. But I killed all the orcs I could so that Sam and Frodo might escape. Satisfactio operis. He's shriven by Aragorn. Aragorn all but blesses him and sends him out to sea. Now again, unless you're Catholic, you're not going to catch that. And that doesn't bother Tolkien that you don't catch that. But you see, he wants his audience to see what forgiveness is about. What it, it's not carte blanche. Well, we'll just let bygones be bygones. Too bad. Wish you hadn't done that, Baramir. No. Baramir <laughs> makes confession and he does acts of penance. Those are the two sacraments that I see, again, echoed, not allegorized. They're not perfect. Aragorn is not a priest. Uh, here are some of the doctrines and practices on the back side of your sheet. Uh, there's a rough parallel, very rough parallel, of the story of Tenuviel and Baron. That's the story, of course, we learned first sung in volume one, where Tenuviel is an elven maiden, remember? of extraordinary beauty, who falls in love with a mortal man named Baron. When Baron comes to die, Tenuviel, as an elf, will not die naturally. Remember, elves can either grieve themselves to death or they can be killed by violent means. But they don't naturally die. They're immortal, naturally. She surrenders her immortality to go with Baron in death. Well, you want to know Philippians 2? Thinking equality with God, not a thing to be grasped after. He emptied himself and took upon the form of a servant and became obedient even unto death. Now again, Tolkien is not saying, if you don't know Philippians 2 in the background here, you're missing the point. No, not the point. But there is a kind of rough, you follow, overtone, a kind of echo there, it seems to me. How many of you have been to Tolkien's grave in Oxford? Anybody? You must make your pilgrimage. You must make your pilgrimage. It's a holy site. There among a bunch of Polish emigres, right where he should be, not with the greats of Oxford, because there were no Roman Catholics at Oxford. <laughs> Beneath Tolkien's name is the word barren. Beneath Edith's, his wife's grave stone, is the word Tenuvio, which his children had placed there. Because Tolkien felt that his wife had done pretty much the same thing, given up her own independent career as a concert pianist to raise their five children and 
to be mother to them and the like. So again, a kind of far off echo, distant gleam of the incarnation in that story of Tenuviel and Baron. Well, the one everybody wants to leap on is Gandalf. We were talking with this with Carter Sneed at the dinner table tonight. Gandalf. Remember, Gandalf is a high figure. He's a Maya. He's one level down by, below the Valar. The Valar are the 15 kinds of sub kind of angelic creatures with whom Iluvatar, the god figure, brings the whole creation into a great symphonic harmony until one of them named Melkor undergoes a terrible revolt. And beneath them then, the Valar are the Maiar, and one of the chief rebels who comes to follow Sauron, uh, come, sorry, comes to follow Melkor is Sauron. So Gandalf is at the same level as Sauron. They're both Maya, singular. The Balrog is a Maya as well. So, in order that the company might flee, might escape from the Balrog, Gandalf does battle with him. And as you know, in that awful battle, Gandalf succeeds in killing the Balrog but only as he himself plunges into the great abyss. If you're a Catholic, if you know what happens on Good Friday evening, it's the descent into hell, being echoed, being very distantly remembered. And of course, then Gandalf comes back from what appears to be death. But notice, he's not Christ. Gandalf doesn't die for the sins of the world. He doesn't even die for the sins of the hobbits. <laughs> and he comes back only to die again. He is not resurrected. There's only one resurrection. He is resuscitated, of which there, of course, have been many, many resuscitations. So you follow? Tolkien is wanting a certain kind of reader to begin to pick up what is in the deep background, not foreground, not central, not a, if you don't get this, you've missed the book, as with an Aslan. It's just there for Tolkien to say, here is where the groundwork really lies for me as a Catholic. I'm not going to put it in your face. I'm not going to make my Catholicism instrumental to something larger, but simply remind you, if you can see, that it's there. Um, the, the very business of vocation. I uh, had the great honor to sit with a young lady tonight who's going to become a member of the Little Sisters of the Poor. She's answered her vocation. Frodo has a similar vocation. When the call comes to me, comes to him, in which Frodo says over and again, why was I chosen? You get that repeated call, chosen, chosen, chosen. And Gandalf says, I can't answer that question, but you have been chosen, and it's your freedom to accept or reject the call. And Frodo, ever so reluctantly, accepts the call and says, I will bear the ring, though I know not how. So you follow, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very reluctant heeding of a vocation, which Christians believe, of course, to have all of us at one point or another in our lives called to. Now, the example, of course, is prayer. Now, this is, remember, a pre-Christian epic. Tolkien, in his 14-volume legendarium that he began working on at age 21 and stopped working on at age 81 when he died, was going to tell the history of the whole cosmos over again in legend and legendary form, so that eventually there would have been an incarnation into Tolkien's world. I speculate in my book, this is shameless self-advertisement, $15, <laughs> <laughs> that the incarnation will occur in a hobbit. God will become human, because remember, hobbits are humans. Hobbits are not a separate species. They're of our own species. You become human in a hobbit. So you have something, it seems to me, like 
prayer, even though you can't have prayer as such. When, when Frodo's tempted to use the ring, he cries out, O Elbereth, Gilthoniel, where those are elven names for Varda. Varda is the queen of the stars. Varda has Marian qualities. He is beseeching, and the word El, if you know Hebrew at all, which I don't, uh, is the word for God, one of the Hebrew words for God. So anytime you have a word like Tenuviel, any word with an E-L in it is a, is a God word in Tolkien. And then what I discovered in teaching Tolkien for the 2800th time, he also in that same prayer calls out, <clears throat> excuse me, O Luthien the Fair. Luthien is not a goddess, not an angelic figure, but a figure of extraordinary beauty. It's something like the invocation of the saints that Tolkien is again hinting at, getting at, as it were, through the back door, if one wants to see why he is a Catholic. The veneration of the Virgin Mary, it seems to me, is clearly hinted at in the figure of Galadriel. Tolkien said, in fact, I could not have created Galadriel except in my devotion to Our Lady. Because Galadriel is a figure of extraordinary beauty and purity. And one of the most important things I do at Baylor is to read those passages about her and ask my Baylor students, is there any woman in this room who figures that kind of beauty? Is there any man in this room that can recognize that kind of beauty? So that Tolkien is trying in his creation of Galadriel to recover for us what real transcendent beauty would look like, as he beheld it, of course, in the Virgin Mary, but doesn't want to push that in our face. And the final example is the overtone of purgatory in volume three where in order to make the assault on the black gates of Mordor, by the way, Mordor is the Anglo-Saxon word for murder. There are all kinds of Anglo-Saxon words going on. Orc, orc is a deliberately ugly word, which Tolkien introduces from the Hobbit, where they're called goblins, into the Lord of the Rings, where they're called orcs. Can you see the, the shift he makes? If I may say so, The Hobbit is a children's book. Three movies Peter Jackson's about to make. My God, <laughs> nothing but special effects. Be prepared. <laughs> but goblins are things you get scared of on Halloween. Not, you know, not really scared. There's somebody dressed up in an outrageous outfit. Orc sounds ugly. Goblin is not a bad word. And orc is the Anglo-Saxon word for demon. So he's trying to get at the really sinister quality of the demonic in changing the word goblin to the word orc. Well, the, these, these creatures who were oath breakers, now remember in the pagan world, if you break an oath, you're consigned to basically exile and death. You have no longer any future use. So they've been pinned off into themselves. But Aragorn comes and delivers them and offers them the chance to come and assist at the battle, what he thinks is going to be the great battle of the Black Gate that enters into Mordor. Because in thus coming to assist him to the point of their own willingness to die, they will have purged their sins. They will have overcome the evil of their oath breaking. So you follow? There's a kind of echo, distant uh, glimmer of purgatory there. But all of those things are implicit. None of them is explicit because Tolkien is not going to use his Catholicism to be a means to an end. He's not going to make it instrumental to his art. 
Now, I pause there and take some questions. What do you think about this, rather than just going on? Anybody want to ask me some questions before I get to the latter part of the, of the, of the talk? Second question, maybe? <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead. Maybe you'll have some at the end. What he does instead, I argue then, is that he introduces, among many other things, three forms of evil that he considers to be the consuming evils of our time. He doesn't give any of them a theological name. In Mary Key's class this morning, we went over the seven deadly sins. Tolkien doesn't say this is number one or number four. And I try to convince Professor Key's class, as I try to convince my Baylor students, that an artist like Tolkien thinks as deeply as the most astute astrophysicist. You know, we have the notion that one can be an artist. Anybody can be an artist. All you have to do is have a piece of paper and a pencil and create a work of art. On the contrary, art is an extraordinarily difficult craft, a discipline. Uh, my hero is a woman named Flannery O'Connor. She says, remember, as an artist, she said, there are more kinds of monasticism than one. She felt that as an artist, she was living a monastic life because she spent all her days imagining the world in a fresh and radical way that will be given lasting form. Tolkien does the same thing when he decides, for whatever reason, to give the ring three powers. Let's look at those three powers. Notice they're universal. Anybody of goodwill can pick up on what the ring does and begin to see some connections with their own lives. He's not doing that overtly as a Christian or as a Catholic. He's wanting to address as wide an audience as he can. And the way I think Pope Benedict is calling us to do is we occupy enclaves of Christian excellence and then produce. He said we have to have a whole new culture of art and science, of literature and the like that will reach the world beyond us. From the sideline now, not from the center now, from the sideline. So those three qualities are, as you see there, deathlessness, invisibility, and coercion. Deathlessness. Remember, if you have the ring, you will not die. You'll go on living longer and longer and longer and longer and longer until Bilbo says, anyone know what Bilbo says? I feel thin and stretched like too little butter over too much bread. A very homey, homey illustration, metaphor. Because Tolkien sees that ours is a world that is now terrified of dying, wanting to stay alive at all costs. I remember the first time I had Stanley Harawas come lecture after he left Notre Dame, I might say, um, under circumstances I'll not go into, um, and uh, to lecture at Wake Forest. We drove by the big hospital there in Winston-Salem. As you know, every city now has as its center either a huge medical complex, a huge business complex, or a huge park. So we have staying alive, making money, and having fun. Every medieval city, of course, is centered around a cathedral. So we passed by this gigantic hospital, Baptist hospital, and Stanley says, behold the house that death has built. Then he added what I'll never forget. He says, most Americans want to die healthy. <laughs> Patently absurd. Um, you heard about the little old ladies who got to paradise and discovered how absolutely wonderful it was. One said to the other, can you believe it? We'd have been here 20 years ago if we had eaten all that granola. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, not seriously. In Walker Percy's novel, Love in the Ruins, 
Books to read before you die, that's on the top. Women jerk their skirts over their knees whenever the word death is mentioned. It's the new obscenity of our culture. Percy says the last sound that the average American will ever hear is the squish of nurses' shoes going down the hospital hall. And horrific. Thank you for squirming. Image. <laughs> W.H. Auden said, I want to die with a heart attack or a stroke. Cheap and quick. <laughs> Our ancestors did not want to die cheap and quick. Flannery O'Connor said, a long illness before death is one of God's great gifts because it lets you get ready to die, not to try to stay alive on and on and on. So what our world is giving us now is what Evelyn Wall calls the unwanted final decade, where you have a diaper between your legs and don't know that you exist. We have, therefore, life stretched horizontally, but no life deepened vertically or ascendantly. So you see what he's doing by making deathlessness? He's trying to say, look, this is our world where people want to stay uh, stay alive. Again, if I may quote my friend Stanley, if you ask the average American, which means all of us now, remember, what is the purpose of life? The average American will say the purpose of life is not to die, but to stay alive as long as possible, to have a good time. The Christian proposition, the Tolkien doesn't say this here. He's hinting at it. The purpose of life is to die in the right way, for having lived the right kind of life so that in death our lives reach their proper culmination. We return our lives like the man in the New Testament, having either buried our talents, our money, our gifts, or having multiplied them and returned them to God. When I was at Providence College, I saw every day in the Providence paper, I don't remember there being in the South Bend paper, maybe they were, a long list of anniversaries. And as a good dumb Baptist, I assumed these were wedding anniversaries. Except I noticed that the pictures were of old people. Because those were anniversaries of people who had died. We celebrate our saints, not on their birthdays, but on their death days. Death for Tolkien is the last enemy to be overcome. Yes, as St. Paul says, but overcome because one knows the power that can overcome it. He doesn't give us that in the, in, in the, in, in the epic, but he says, look, what's going on with the world that worships? Staying alive. Invisibility. Why would he give the ring that quality? That if you have the ring, you can wear the ring and become invisible. Well, in part because he knows Plato's Republic. Now recall, Tolkien was speaking Greek in high school. In fact, for the high school drama, they put on a Greek tragedy in Greek. And then at the commencement exercise, God saved the, sang, God saved the king in Greek. <laughs> so he knows the Republic. He knows that Socrates gets in a debate with Glaucon. Socrates, of course, arguing that good is intrinsic to itself. It needs no reward. You don't have to pay anybody to be good. Good is itself satisfying. But Glaucon says, remember there was a man named Gyges, who had a magical ring, which if he wore, he could disappear. 
course, it's Glaucon's way of actually being better Christian than Socrates. He's talking about the crookedness of the human will. And what does he do? He begins to steal. You can get away easily, grab what you want and disappear. He begins to kill, not going to be caught. Of course, he winds up killing the king, marrying the queen, all because he has the power of invisibility. So what kind of historical application do you think Tolkien wants a general audience of people of goodwill to draw from that? Where are the places of invisibility in our culture? I suggest the internet. No one sees you unless you Skype with your grandchildren the way David Solomon and I do. No one holds you accountable. You can say anything and get away with it, whether it's true or untrue. You can disappear. That's what worried Tolkien about modernity. He said, what happens in modernity is that the distance between the conception of an idea and the realization of that idea gets ever shorter and shorter and shorter until they finally collapse. There's no distance. So we are obsessed with the kind of invisibility of the instantaneous, where there is no long, difficult act of creation. Why do marriages fail? People won't take the trouble to learn what it means to be a faithful spouse. Everything good requires time, length, work, labor, endurance. Invisibility allows instant accomplishment. Finally and most importantly, the rain gives the power of coercion. If you have the ring, you can not only disappear. If you have the ring, you don't only go on living endlessly. Above all, if you have the ring, you can coerce the wills of others. You can make them do what you want. So that the ring comes to have addictive power over its owner. You know, Bilbo is a creature of manifest goodness. There's no reason Bilbo would not do what he should do, which is to be a temporary keeper of the ring until Gandalf can find out for sure it really is the one ruling ring, and then Gandalf, the figure of great prudence, can help them decide how the ring should be disposed of. But what happens? When Gandalf Asked Bilbo for the ring, he becomes fiercely angry. He backs off from, from, from Gandalf. He winds up using the very words of Gollum. He says, it's mine. Because the ring has begun to work its grip on him. It's, become, it's begun to coerce his will. For Tolkien, coercion is the fundamental characteristic of the modern world. Even more so than invisibility, even more so than this mania for longevity. Now, of course, the obvious reference are to the totalitarian states of the modern world. He lived, alas, long enough to know the regimes, not only of Germany and Russia, but also, of course, of China. He thought that our age was unprecedented in the way in which it not only is coercive, but deadly in its coercions, so that in the 20th century alone, roughly 170 million people were killed, almost all of them by their own governments. No wonder the blessed John Paul calls ours the culture of death. It's the culture of death because it is the culture of 
coercion. When people will not do what they're supposed to do, you can force them and coerce them. Well, we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? No coercion in America. Right? Wrong. I saw today in class an example. I dare my better students to go one hour without using the word like <laughs> to mean either similar to or akin to. And they can't do it. They cannot do it. They didn't come to the moment and say, now I'm going to forever say like every third word. They were engulfed by a culture with me which has them use the word like. Well, you say, that's pretty innocent. It's okay, I guess. I have a student at Baylor, freshman class. Remember, Baylor is not Brown. Baylor is not Oberlin. Baylor is called the buckle on the Bible belt. <laughs> and a young lady, freshman, wore, this is, this is gross, get ready, but please get the point a very tight-fitting shirt that read, goats do like to nibble. Now, that young lady didn't decide one morning, I'm going to be a slut. No. No. You see, she was so hyper-sexualized by our culture that her will was, in effect, coerced. She never even thought about the way in which her life had been totally sexualized by a culture that is so addictive, so coercive. Need I mention drugs? Pretty obvious. One sniff of cocaine. You know, I never tried it. I, they say it's pretty good. I guess I ought to at least try it. That's good. That's good. I'd like some more. That's really good. I've got to have some more. I'll kill to get it. I have a very dear friend who is charged with double felonies of attempted armed robbery of a drug dealer trying to get prescription medications, oxycodone primarily, for his drug addiction. He's not a bad guy. His parents are devoutly Christian. He grew up in a Christian home, Christian environment. There wasn't a day when he said, I'm going to set out to be a drug addict. Our culture coerced his very will. Not to say he's irresponsible. Don't get me wrong. He is responsible for what he has done. But he did it in the midst of a coercive world. Tolkien is appealed. I think it's precisely to our sense of the coercive, addictive quality of much of our public life. Therefore, I remember at Wake Forest, my second year, a student saying to me, I said this to Professor Key's class, I didn't know what he meant, but I think I now know. He said, when I read Tolkien, I feel clean. It's 1972. You probably know, surely you know, clean is the antithesis to <coughs> drug taking. I feel clean when I read Tolkien. So are you with me? No overt, in-your-face Catholicism whereby it becomes instrumental to the creation of his art, but this powerful, moral, spiritual, even religious vision that has an appeal that it seems to me is absolutely unyielding and wonderfully lasting. And I'm going to stop there and let you ask me questions and you fill in the last three parts on your own. I've taught long enough.
My, my dear wife, who didn't come with me, I wish she would have said, you have never given a speech that was too short. <laughs> Thank so, you very much, Professor Wood. We do have time for a couple questions, so I can bring the mic around. Thank you. Uh, you didn't have a chance yet to make fun of technology, so I thought I would encourage you to take a few minutes to do that. You mentioned earlier that was uh, yeah, well, you know, for, when your cell phone rang, and it's an issue for tokens. So I thought yeah, you could speak Tolkien, to that. For Tolkien, the ultimate example of the attempt to do things instantaneously and thereby crush time, crunch time, magically is in the form of modern technology. Uh, again, he's not a Luddite. He's not one who tried to destroy machines or hated machines. He, he himself, by what I call the biblical method, seek and ye shall find, typed out triple drafts of the 1,200 page Lord of the Rings. Whereas if he'd had a computer, it would have gone much easier. But no, the point for Tolkien is we have cut ourselves off from the fundamental rhythms of life because technology lets us triumph over them. We're meeting in a room that's brilliantly lit. The rest of the world has gone to bed because it's night. Concrete example. Be careful not to be too personal, but I have a schizophrenic son. There are two basic theories of schizophrenia, and I've talked with Alistair McIntyre about this. He knows an, an awful lot about it. One is that it's an ancient disease that's endemic to the human condition, and that the Chinese discovered it 2,500 years ago. The other thesis is that, which I find persuasive, that schizophrenia is an entirely modern disease that arises with the Industrial Revolution. When people stop living according to the basic rhythms of the natural order. It has now been proved just last year, this is really uncanny, that the position of the stars in the Lord of the Rings are exactly where they should be at the time of year they appear. So you don't just have the star of the morning and the star of the evening as just up there. He places them right where they would be in the constellation where they would be at the time of the year where they would be. He therefore thinks that the danger of technology is that it lets us overcome. I mean, for example, the cooked meal is about gone. Gollum eats raw fish and thereby denies the very basis of civilization, which is the shared cooked meal. I guess you all have microwaves the way my wife and I do. I mean, a cooked meal takes a long time. You can instantly have a microwave meal. Rather pedestrian examples, but I think it's something like that. Not living in accord with the most basic patterns, rhythms of the world. That doesn't mean he's, he's, he wants us all to rusticate. He's not a Wendell Berry. You know, Berry lives on an 80 acre farm because he's rich off his books. <laughs> He could not live there were he not rich. Tolkien lived his whole life in Birmingham and Oxford. And, and he's, a, he's an urban man. But he thinks even as urbanites, we ought to be conscious of the way in which night really means night. Day really means day. Meals really mean meals. Does that help? Microphone, so the whole crowd, yes, right there. You mentioned at the beginning of your lecture. Uh, Louder, the, so I'm deaf as a post. You, you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture the respective faults of the left and the right. Did Tolkien ever touch, in the, those, touch on those points in either of his, in The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings? And there are obviously wars, and perhaps you could see the elves as the socially concerned hippies. I don't know, but if you could. 
What, you're asking what were Tolkien's politics? Yes, well, when did he, how, how did he address those faults? Well, that's good, that's good. Tolkien was a Tory. <laughs> Tolkien was a monarchist. Tolkien was a traditionalist. So if you want to put him on the political spectrum, he's on the right, no doubt. But my point is, he never lets his Catholicism become a way of reinforcing his being a man of the right. In fact, his daughter Priscilla told me, she, by the way, looks just like a hobbit. <laughs> She's about four feet eight. And she has a nice paunch, the way the hobbits do. They eat six times a day. No slim fast in hobbit. <laughs> Wonderful. She told me that while my father voted a straight Tory ticket, he hated the vernacular mass. He was a hidebound traditionalist, a thoroughgoing monarchist. He did more for the common laborers at Oxford than all the liberals put together. So you with me? He, on the one hand, is on the right wing, and yet he really cares about the poor. But in neither case is he going to make his Catholicism something that's identified with right wing politics, or if you were a man of the left, left wing politics. The church is larger than the world. It's the largest thing in the world and larger than the world, and therefore can never be suborned to some other noble project. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your, your talk, Father Jerry Ehrman in the theology department. Yes. And I think one of the implicit doctrines or practices that I've never seen anyone write about comes from the appendices and the chronology. Oh, yes. So that the, the nine companions set out on their quest on December 25th. Yes. But I think even more astounding is that the ring is destroyed on March 25th. Yes. Which is not only the Feast of the Annunciation, but it's also the Feast of the Death Day of St. Dismas, the good thief, mm -hmm. which means it's the death day of Jesus Christ, that it's Good sure. Friday, that Good. on that day the ring is destroyed, that evil mm -hmm. is overcome. Excellent. Not only that, but you probably know that in the early church, creation was said to have occurred on March 25th. So it's the day when the whole world comes into being. It's not only the day of the Annunciation, it's the day which God announces creation. Yes, it's all there. And again, background stuff that Tolkien... It's happy for somebody to find out, but it's in the appendices. It's not, at the, as it were, at the front. Good. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Now, I know Tolkien calls his work a sub-creation, but I was wondering what you would say to someone who argues that by not making his Catholicism instrumental to his art, he's putting his art above Catholicism. How do you make your, the argument against that? Did you repeat that? her question? I didn't quite. I didn't hear it either. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Is Tolkien putting uh, his art above Catholicism? Oh, is Tolkien putting his art above Catholicism? Oh, no. A thousand <laughs> times, no. In fact, he was writing his legendarium primarily for himself. I have very good Catholic friends at Baylor who are worried about the cult of Tolkien. I have a student, thank God she's not a Catholic, who has memorized all the genealogies. She holds them in her head. <laughs> all the genealogies. I want to say, get a life. <laughs> I mean, this is idolatry. Tolkien would have been horrified at your doing that. No, his art was on the one hand, his pastime, but it was his real passion. Um, he would get the kids in bed, go upstairs. He worked cross-legged in the middle of a double bed with all of his notes spread around him. Because as a Catholic, he wanted to create a really first-rate work of art that would have, its, as I've said before, its own intrinsic excellence. And that would be his devotion to God. It would be a shortcut that was not devoted to God if he imported his Catholicism as something that had to prop up his book. Thank you. Good question. Yes, there, this fellow's hand has been up. 
Okay, well, one, we're going to get to you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I am a, I'm a English PhD student here, and I find I find it interesting that um, uh, that Tolkien Tolkien and Lewis both um, you know wrote wrote literature you know especially in the case of Tolkien that has been you know the highest selling novel of the of the twentieth century yeah. and 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 yet there's a certain um, academic snobbery toward him, I, mm -hmm. I would say. I would say, uh, you know, I, I sort of feel like I'm in the closet as a Tolkien lover when I'm yeah. in my yeah. English academic circles. And I'm, I'm curious about that in, in the light of the fact that you predict that, uh, you know, Tolkien, Tolkien will remain in 100 years. Yeah. And I'm sort of curious about why, why you would suppose, if Tolkien speaks so much to um, the human condition and the human psyche, why, why there's that, that rejection from the academic circle Good. that he had walked among. You were right for the first three decades after The Lord of the Rings was published. It was roundly scorned by, by academics as beneath their dignity. You would never teach a whole course as Professor Keyes does. But a woman at Rice, a secular woman at a secular university, persuaded her chair, she's a medievalist, to let her teach a course in Tolkien. On the grounds that he knows so much about the Middle Ages, you will learn about the Middle Ages from mastering him. At the medieval conference in Kalamazoo every year, they began with one session devoted to Tolkien. There are now five. So Tolkien has now been legitimated in the academic world, thanks to Jane Chance and her followers and these are, not, on the whole, not Christians. They're hard-headed, secular medievalists, but who cannot ignore Tolkien. The other story about Tolkien is that at David Solomon's alma mater, University of Texas, there is a very high-powered course in linguistics that does nothing but study the two forms of Elvish. <laughs> Seriously. Quenya. And what's the other one? Sindarin. Quenya, as you probably know, is based on Welsh. Sindarin is based on Finnish. And the point of the course is, if you want to see what an ideal language would be like, here it is. <laughs> Tolkien has produced it. Again, no affirmation of what Tolkien is saying, but just saying, if you want excellence of the highest kind, linguistically, Let's do, and the whole course is devoted to those two languages. Amazing, amazing. Our friend on the front row, at last. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It thank kind you. of reminded me of Flannery O'Connor's essay, A Catholic Novelist and Their Readers. Yes. Um, in which he says that a uh, writer writes from his or her sensibilities, and this seems to be what you're saying about Tolkien's Catholicism, that. Uh, it's very understated, and um, it's not something that he tries to do, but it's something that he just does naturally. Uh, so uh, my question is, and it may be too late for me as a senior here, but um, how can uh, Notre Dame students uh, seek to cultivate these sensibilities that could come out in their work? Good. There's the agenda for Father Miss Campbell, <laughs> for the president, for the provost, for the faculty, that would be what Notre Dame should be doing. Cultivating a very deep Catholic sensibility by immersion in the very things I referred to in the first part of my lecture. I just say you should emerge from Notre Dame a better Catholic than when you enter because you've been more fully grounded in the doctrines, in the sacraments, and in the moral practices of the church. I didn't mention this, but I don't know if you're aware of how many Catholics use the term inviolability of conscience to get by with horrific things. Yes, conscience is inviolable. It is not infallible. Crucial distinction. Therefore, in my view as a Protestant, Notre Dame should be about the business 
not only of forming Catholic sensibilities, but Catholic consciences. Because your fundamental obligation is to have a well-formed conscience. So that to appeal to the inviolability of conscience works out to mean, well, I do whatever I think is good and right. Whatever is good for me. Whatever pleases me. You see, I'm going down and down and down the scale. So, yeah. Um, and that's why Tolkien was so grateful. He, he, he regarded his mother as a martyr because she overworked herself and died young, that Tolkien and his brother could have a thoroughly Catholic upbringing in Edgebaston, a suburb of Birmingham, where they were at the oratory established by Cardinal Newman as altar boys. They went to school at the oratory school. And then the priest put in charge of them when she died, Tolkien's father had died when he was only three, saw that the oratory school was not going to be sufficiently challenging to a genius like young Ronald. He put him in King Edward's school in the city of Birmingham so he could get an even better education because he knew his conscience had been formed as a Catholic from the start. My Catholic students tell me that catechesis is awful, that they were given so little in catechism that they hardly know why they should be Catholics. It pleases me to no end that many of them are now RCIA instructors. They've, a bunch of them, a couple of them done it here at Notre Dame, have taken training to become RCIA instructors so that they are doing really serious catechesis to young people in their churches when they go out into the world. See, Notre Dame should be forming RCIA instructors by giving both Catholic sensibility through reading widely in literary texts. So you can't just have the doctrines and practices and sacraments. Yes, that's the foundation, but that foundation opens out to everything else. Yes, ma'am, I can maybe hear you if you will shout. Okay, um, I love your connection between Tolkien's mission of recovering the symbol and the violence of modern rationalized states where we no longer are symbol readers. Um, and so, hit, so we're no longer symbols, so we, then we can be slaughtered and coerced as if we're not the meaning of the human body. So who was... Tolkien reading to recover the symbol, um, and how who, who should we read um, to do that in our own work? Well, good question. Who was Tolkien reading, and who should we be reading? At Bader, we no longer allow dissertations on any of the Oxford Inklings Tolkien, Lewis, Charles Williams, Dorothy Sayers. We encourage dissertations on the people they read. So I had a student who did a dissertation on the Kalevala, <coughs> a great, as you know, epic of the, of, the, of the Nordic world and the way it influences Tolkien. So the first thing is just to read very widely across the whole span, especially of Western literature, so that you know how the world works in previous cultures, but also therefore to know what's wrong and what's right with our culture. A concrete example. Does it, anyone remember the passage through the dead marshes scene in The Lord of the Rings? One of the most horrible scenes in the whole book. A brilliant book by John Garth, G-A-R-T-H, called Tolkien and the Great War is a crucial book. What Garth demonstrates that Tolkien went back for the 50th anniversary of his high school graduating class and saw that it had been wiped out by the first war, where Tolkien, of course, fought 
and was, in, was severely um, sick with trench fever, almost died. When he saw the room empty of his classmates, there came flooding back to him the memory of what happened at the Somme, probably the worst battle of World War I. And that is when he came up out of the trenches over the top to go firing away, usually they would gain or lose 15 yards a day. That's how important that battle was. He was walking on the faces and heads of his comrades that were lying frozen in the mud. You've got to read that kind of literature as well. You can't just read the hopeful, helpful stuff. So both kinds. You've been very patient. It, oh, I think we have to finish, Professor. So um, with that, we'd like to thank Professor Wood. And just before you all leave, I have um, one announcement. Next week, Wednesday, October 3rd, we are having a panel discussion on the economy and the election. Um, so that's going to be at 7.30 PM in the McCartan courtroom. Um, and we encourage all of you to come. And if any of you still have questions, please feel free to come up and ask Professor you Wood. You have my email address and my Facebook. My, um, <laughs> gosh, I don't do Facebook. So <laughs> My website. My website has a bunch of Tolkien stuff on it. So thank you very much. Thank you.